So the technology is doing one specific part of that pathway. So that comes back to, you know, you can identify cats, we can now identify heart valves as well. Um, in mental health trusts, we're seeing technology being used to identify when people are getting up in the night. So staff no longer need to be able to go regularly into rooms and see if people are stirring if someone has fallen. And so what happens now is the technology is able to detect when someone is moving in their bed, if they are getting up, staff can go in and assist those people. And that means that it's actually reducing falls. Um, the humble stethoscope is also being changed by digital technology. We're seeing, I think that there might be some links for some of the presentations later on, but we've seen the humble telescope, the telescope, stethoscope being moved into the digital arena. So now instead of being audio based, you can see something visually. You can also apply digital uh, AI technology to that stethoscope to then be able to identify health, uh, sorry, heart failure. So it's, a, it's now doing things that we weren't perhaps able to do before by just listening to things. Um, in India, where I'm sure you're aware again that there's a, a massive ratio between healthcare professionals and population. So um, there's a lot of different ways that they're trying to apply AI technology, one of which is screening for tuberculosis. So they're using AI to try and screen their population, try and identify um, where people are having symptoms of, of TB. So that's kind of what's in the pipeline. I'm just going to briefly talk about what's, what does the future hold. So that's, there's, there's obviously a lot of research in this area. Some of the research is particularly interesting. The ones that are exactly are quite interesting as well. So we talk a lot about the doctor-patient relationship and the empathy that, that people need to be able to have a therapeutic consultation or to have care that is delivered, delivered around them. So some of the research that's emerging shows that actually people perceive empathy as well as receive empathy. By that I mean that if you have a chatbot, you can actually have people who are using the chatbot feel like the chatbot is listening to them, it is empathising with them, because the person using it feels that they are being listened to and seen heard. And there is some empathy there. So it's, what we um, could anticipate in the future is that the chatbots will become more empathetic, they can provide a bit more of that softer support that people might need. I'll pause there actually, yeah, I've got another point on it later. So um, at the bottom here, it's really interesting again what we're seeing around AI in its ability to see things that we cannot see as people. So um, some of the analysis around retinal images, so the image of the back of your eye, AI is now being able to show that it can detect high risk of stroke and heart attack. So by detect, looking at the back of your eye, you might be able to, in the near future, have a risk score against your risk of having a heart attack or a stroke. It's not been possible before, it's not something you can really detect as a, as a human, but AI is starting to show that you can do that. Similarly with the ECGs, we're starting to see that actually that curve of the cardiogram, so the, the electric signals that you find in the heart, is able to give indications of heart attacks again. So things that weren't possible by people are possible in terms of some technologies. Um, and then there's also things that are around the development of how we speak and how we code that information, how the information is captured. So natural language processing, how what we speak is captured in text, um, is being developed. So Microsoft recently, I think, either purchased or collaborate with a company called Nuance, uh, who are developing natural language processing for a consultation environment. So when you go see a doctor, the doctor spends some time on the computer and also with you. That's split attention. Um, so how do you stop that and how do you support information to be captured so the doctor can spend more time with the person in that consultation? And so the, the, there's an application of natural language processing that's continuing to be developed around that use case. Um, however, it's not all kind of rosy, everything's going to be amazing in the future. AI, as I mentioned, can see things that we cannot see, but it also is developed on the data that we have in the system. Now the data that we have in the system is not necessarily representative of us, not representative of the care, and the care that is provided in the services are not necessarily equitable either. 
So, um, for example, the, um, there was a Pascal facial recognition system that was actively in use for a short period of time, which didn't, uh, was unable to identify people's faces if they had dark skin, very pale skin, or above um, average lip size, for example. So they, they had a, a very narrow window of people that it was trained on. Um, in America, I think it's something like 40% of um, black people don't receive the pain medication that they need in emergency departments. So if you imagine that's how people are treated, that's what the data tells the algorithm to treat people by, then that's what the algorithm will then tell clinicians what to do. And so we need to think about how this data is actually representative and working um, for, I suppose, informing the, the computers. Um, as I mentioned, AI can see things that we don't are unable to see. And that has good implications, potentially, as I mentioned, for retinal scanning, also uh, worrying uh, consequences. So there was a, an article in Wired recently, there's been some research papers published around this, where medical images use uh, AI applied to the medical images, can actually identify protected characteristics. So it's not necessarily uh, imaging protected characteristics, it's not logged in the data, but it can identify uh, sex, for example, uh, race, <coughs> as Hemo says here, and so that's going to have implications for other parts of this, the decision-making process. Again, AI can detect these things, so it's about consideration of what do we do when we know these things happen. Um, so I suppose like, to underline that, is, AI is, is depends, like currently, AI training depends upon large amounts of data. So the things that would work best are the things that are generally very common, that they track often, and, and with the largest data sets. Um, and so what we can possibly assume that would be happening in the future is those highly frequent activities where there's lots of data will be assisted by AI <coughs> in the future. However, there's things that are very complex and um, have multiple factors to them, like people with three different conditions in different kind of um, parts of their body at different ages, that kind of stuff, or there's things that happen very infrequently and very serious, so brain tumors in children, for example, I think a GP in their career would see them two times. So you can imagine there's not much data on that. So how do you solve that using machine learning and AI as it currently stands? So there's things that were very frequent that we could probably see AI being applied for. There's things that are more complex and less frequent that is less likely that AI would have a solution for. And that's why we need more people there. So will AI replace doctors? Um, a bit of a sense check, the largest neural network is approximately the size of neural network, of the mouse brain, so we can consider actually what is that capable of. Um, I suppose one of the things I always say is you wouldn't use a washing machine to wash your dishes. So by that I mean that AI is very specific. I mean, in essence, a washing machine and a dishwasher does the same thing. They, they, something in, there's water, there's soap, you get something out that's clean, right? The dead's gone. In essence, AI is very narrow. So the sec image segmentation of the heart I mentioned is great to find a heart valve, but it won't tell the clinician if they can how to move the probe to get a better heart image. It won't tell the clinician what care a person needs afterwards. It will just segment the heart part. You couldn't use that tool right now on x-ray images, it's only used for spot percent. So when I say we're using washing machines clean dishes, what I mean is it's very specific around what AI can do currently. Um, so the, I think the best way to think about AI is a new member of the team, which means it will take tasks off of existing staff, it will change staff roles, it will change what they do. So there are massive implications for staff and how they work. So I mentioned fall prevention technology. There's also robotics that's been implemented in most in Japan, but it's starting to find its way into uh, other countries like USA and here. And so what you find is, for example, the false prevention technology, staff, you need the staff to be working at night. 
that means they're doing less hours, they are getting paid less, but they have a better work-life balance. And it improves all the, the quality of care that people are having as well. So it's a bit of a trade-off as well. So there are implications to that. And I suppose to just finish off, I'd say that we might not want all of the capability they are. So if we think about, say, self-driving vehicles, we were promised the dream of flying cars and back in the future. Uh, Elon Musk continually promises the dream of uh, not needing to drive a car, we can watch telly, do our or whatever we want to do in car. In reality, we're not there yet. We see some of the accidents that have happened. I'm sure you've seen the headlines. The backup plan for a self-driving car is someone sitting there. But what we're finding is when they're sitting there, they're not really engaged, they're not paying attention. So if you think about that concept of, okay, here's a car, it's doing its thing, and someone is sitting there, but they're not really engaged. And you think about, okay, what if we had that as a surgery? What if we had a, a robot that was doing some surgery, but you've got, you've, your surgeon there, just as back, <coughs> engaged, but what if something goes wrong, and then can they react in time? So maybe we don't want AI to do everything it can do just yet, because we haven't got the appropriate safety netting support around it. And uh, I think that's me. Thank you.